the NGAR, Cambridge's Engineering Admissions Assessment, tests maths and physics skills. In this video, I'm going to be diving into some questions to give you a taster and to help you with how to approach them. My name is Sam, and this is Oxcentric. If you haven't already watched part one where I introduce what the NGAR is and discuss some tips and tricks, I'd highly recommend watching that first. I've taken these example questions from the NGAR syllabus from 2019, so this should be representative of the current type of question, although I do think these are slightly easier than some of the toughest past questions. I'm going to briefly put the question on screen before I start talking through my explanation, so if you want you can pause the video at this point and attempt the question before I talk you through my solution. And without further ado, let's get started. So this is our first question and this is from section 1, part A, which is the standard maths and physics. So, a ball is thrown vertically upwards and leaves the thrower's hand with a speed of 12 meters per second. It can be assumed that all of the initial kinetic energy of the ball has been converted into gravitational potential energy when the ball reaches its highest point. To what height does the ball rise? So we know that this is probably going to be a conservation of energy problem. So in this case, we are told that the ball initially has kinetic energy, which is equal to half mv squared. And this is converted into gravitational potential energy, which is equal to mgh. When we set these two equal to each other as all of the kinetic energy is converted into gravitational potential, we can cancel off the mass, and subsequently, as we want to find height, we can rearrange to find that v squared over 2g is equal to h. Now, beyond this point, it's just a matter of subbing in some values. So v is equal to 12, hence v squared is equal to 144, and g is equal to 10, as given here in the question. So therefore, h is equal to 144, over 2 times 10, which is equal to 7.2 meters. Therefore, our answer is going to be A. Question 2. A shape is formed by drawing a triangle ABC inside of the triangle ADE. BC is parallel to DE, and then we're given some various side lengths. So AB is equal to 4 centimeters, BC is equal to X centimeters, DE is equal to x plus 3 centimetres, and DB is equal to x minus 4 centimetres. So also that means that this side AD, x minus 4 plus 4, is all equal to x centimetres. So what is the length in centimetres of DE? So we're told that the shape is formed by drawing a triangle inside of this triangle ADE. So therefore, we can say that the triangle ADE is an enlargement of the triangle ABC. So they should have all the same angles, that angle is shared, these angles would be the same, and so on. So therefore, we also know that the ratio of enlargement for the sides is going to be the same. So for example, the ratio of DE to BC should be equal to the ratio of AD to AB. So let's think about those ratios. So X plus 3 over X, that's between DE and BC, and it's equal to the ratio of AD to AB. So X over 4. Now, we need to rearrange this a bit because we can't solve for x in this form. So 4 times x plus 3 is equal to x squared. Do a bit of rearranging here. Minus 4x minus 12 is equal to 0. Now, from this point, we can refactorize this. So this will actually factorize to x minus 6, x plus 2 is equal to 0. So now this gives us two solutions for x, x equals 6 or x equals minus 2. Now as this is a real life triangle, we can't have a negative value for x because bc can't be minus 2 centimeters long. Therefore x is equal to 6. de therefore is equal to 6 plus 3 as it's x plus 3. It's equal to 9 centimeters, meaning that the answer is c. So this is question 3, which is taken from section 1, part b. A particle of weight 5 newtons is held in position by two light ropes. One of the ropes makes an angle of 60 degrees with the upwards vertical, and the other is horizontal. What is the tension in the horizontal rope? 
So what might be useful is to draw a diagram to represent this. So let's have a wall, that can be our upwards vertical, and our first force is acting at an angle of 60 degrees. Let's call this force T1. Here's our particle, and that has the weight mg, which is 5 newtons, acting upon it. And we also have a second rope, which has a tension of T2, and that's going to be attached at a different place. So, we are told in the question that the particle is held in position. So, for this reason, we know that the forces acting upon the particle are in equilibrium, and we also know that forces in equilibrium form a closed triangle. So let's draw that out now. So we are told because this is horizontal and this is the upwards vertical, this is going to be a right angle. That's going to be our T2. 60 degrees. That's going to be our 5 newtons. And that's going to be our T1. So from here we can actually just use the definitions of tan, tan theta, is equal to the opposite of the adjacent. That's our adjacent, that's our opposite. So tan 60 is equal to root 3, and A is equal to 5. Therefore, root 3 is equal to T2 over 5, and therefore T2 is equal to 5 root 3. Therefore, our answer is going to be A. Question 4. What is the smallest possible value of the integral from 1 to 0 of x minus a all squared with respect to x as a varies? So let's think about what that graph might look like first. So what this graph basically is, is a standard quadratic but displaced by a to the right. So we want to minimise the area underneath to make the integral as small as possible. And just by inspection, say if we chose two arbitrary points, then these two arbitrary points that are further away from the centre have a lot bigger area under them than those two here, which are slightly closer to the centre. So ideally, to minimise the area, we want to have the centre slap bang in the middle of our range that we're working with. So by inspection, if our ranges were 0 and 1, obviously not quite to scale, then we would have a as equal to a half. So therefore we're going to use a is equal to a half. So we're going to do our integral from 1 to 0 of x minus half, or squared with respect to x, which is going to be x minus half cubed over 3. And now we just have to sub in some of our limits. So 1 minus half cubed over 3, minus minus half, 0 minus half, cubed over 3. So we can again expand this, so it's half cubed over 3, minus, or in this case because we're minusing a minus plus, half cubed over 3, which is going to be equal to 1 8 over 3 plus 1 8 over 3, quarter of 3, which is equal to 1 12th. So therefore our smallest possible value is 1 12th and the answer is A. So this is question 5 which is our first from section 2. A seismic wave causes the surface of the earth to vibrate. The vibration at a building some distance from the epicentre of the earthquake has a period of 2 seconds. A second building is 1 kilometre further from the epicentre. The vibration at the second building is pi over 3 radians out of phase with that at the first. What is the speed of the wave? Okay, so a good start point would be to use the formula for wave speed. So V is equal to F lambda, where F is the frequency and lambda is the wavelength. So F is actually relatively easy to calculate. We know that F is equal to 1 over T, where T is the time period. In this instance, T is equal to 2. So therefore, f is equal to 1 over 2, or half. Now, to find out what lambda is, we're going to have to be a bit more clever. So, let's draw on just to roughly demonstrate how a full wave would look. So that's 2 pi, and here, approximately, 
is pi over 3 radians out of phase. So 2 pi represents the full wave, pi over 3 represents what proportion of the full wave this is out of phase. So at here we've got building 2 and at 0 we have building 1. So for a single wave we know that pi over 3 is 1 sixth of the total wave. So and because this is also a single wave, we know that the phase difference is going to be proportional to the real life distance apart. So this one kilometer distance is going to be one sixth of the full distance of the wave. So therefore, that would be six kilometers. Hence, we can say that lambda would also be six kilometers for that reason. So now we just have to sub this back in. So V is equal to half times 6, which equal to 3 kilometers per second, hence our answer is going to be E. Question 6, our final question. A ray of light in air strikes the surface of a rectangular transparent block at an angle of 60 degrees to the normal. The ray passes through the block and exits from the far side as shown. The width of the block is 5.0 centimetres and the distance between the normal at the point of entry to the block and the normal at the point of exit from the block is 2.5 centimetres, so what is the refractive index of the block? Okay, so we know in this question that we're going to need Snell's law, so that's the formula n1 sine theta1 is equal to n2 sine theta2, where in this instance sine theta2, or theta2 in that case, is here and sine theta1 is taken from here. So n1, we're told that the block is in air, so n1, the optical density of air, is equal to 1. Now for sine theta 1, it's equal to sine 60, and that is equal to root 3 over 2. So therefore we know root 3 over 2 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. Okay, so the ultimate thing we want to find is n2. So that implies we should be able to deduce what sine theta 2 is. So we can do this using some of the lengths that we have. So we're told that the block is a rectangle. So this angle here is a right angle. Now, this means we can redraw this as a new triangle here. So this is theta 2, which we want to calculate. And we've got the length here of 5 centimeters, length here of 2.5 centimeters, or 5 over 2 and an unknown hypotenuse. Now, there's a couple of ways we could go about finding theta 2. One potential way would be trying to find tan theta 2 and working from there. However, tan theta 2 would be equal to 1 half and this isn't a standard value. So we're going to have to try something else. Sine theta 2 is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So if we calculate what the hypotenuse is, then we're sorted. So h is therefore equal to the square root of 5 over 2 all squared plus 5 squared equal to 25 over 4 plus 25 equal to the square root of 125 over 4 is equal to 5 root 5 over 2. So that is our hypotenuse and we know that sine theta 2 is the opposite so 5 over 2 over our hypotenuse. So therefore sine theta 2 is equal to 5 over 2 over 5 root 5 over 2 is equal to 1 over root 5. So perfect, now we can substitute this back into our earlier formula. So root 3 over 2 is equal to n2 over root 5. And when we multiply both sides by root 5, root 3 times root 5 over 2 and therefore this will go to root 15 over 2. Therefore we know that our answer is going to be h. So that concludes my exploration of the Cambridge NGAR. This is a tough test but with enough practice you can absolutely nail this exam. As long as you watch the clock, know the content and keep your cool, everything should go smoothly. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more content. Filming this now just to let you guys know how badly my knees suffered during the making of this video, because it was... it was not good.